I'm going to split this message in two, so to speak. I'll start one in one place and end in another. And I've told you I'm just kind of going at this, letting the Lord lead. So I'm still in our series on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And this is message number 15. I wonder how many more messages we can, we can do. You never know with the Scots, <laughs> all things are possible. Uh, but I told you I'm going to start in one place and in another. So I, I want you first to turn, although it will not be where ultimately we stay, I want you to turn to 1 John and the fourth chapter. And I'm going to tell you right away that uh, I will do much more elaborating on this, on the Festival of Faith. For those people who don't know what that is, it is the program that plays in between these services on the home network, which on the replay, they will put up the website, if they haven't already, on the screen. So you can see where you can tune in. There are programs on the homepage itself, our YouTube channel. There's plenty of places you can go and watch. But the Festival of Faith is not this uh, sanctuary here. Indeed, it is another sanctuary uh, where you can see me probably and my late husband seated and uh, not moving around too much discussing the subjects out of the Bible. So I'll elaborate more on the festival of faith. However, I just want to kind of point something out. John writing here in 1 John 4th chapter, he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. And it's kind of an interesting thing that this chapter, you'll read a lot of of God, ye are of God. Uh, so he that is not of God heareth not us. So of God is a key thing in this chapter. This is beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now it is self-evident if one reads the chapters that come before, a large portion of in fact, the first three chapters um, have much to do about love, loving God, loving one another, the love of God. And so this, is a, this section begins a caution because he says many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, people would tend to think that that would mean we could, we could see somebody and they will be dressed like they'll have a flashing neon sign that says false prophet. <laughs> right? But Christ identified these people, even in his day, calling them wolves in sheep's clothing. So there's something really subtle here. Even those false prophets gone out into the world may talk much about love and the subject of love. There is, that's a footnote caution right there, because you think maybe false prophets will propagate hate, and some do, and they'll propagate other things. But on the backdrop of him talking so much about love, it's indeed possible for these false prophets to whom he was referring to make much to do about the subject of love and yet still not proclaim the message of the good news that Jesus Christ has indeed come in the flesh. The miracle of God taking up a tent in human flesh uh, to kin himself with us. And John goes on to say, Hereby you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, even now already is, it is in the world. So a few things. If you remember, there was a teaching, it seems like eons ago, that's the spirit of exaggeration, on the word confession, which we looked at at the root homologia. And if you remember, I kind of summed it up at the end of that teaching by saying that if it was simply to open the mouth, if it was simply to speak forth, why even evil and unclean spirits recognized Jesus, the Christ, in the flesh. 
because they, they, they saw him and they trembled and they knew who he was. So it cannot be limited. This is that error when we come to the uh, words and their meanings between Greek and English can vary and have a much different connotation. So when we say confesseth, that word homologia, I summed it up by saying, and forgive me, by using the word belief, because we know that every time the word belief or believe is, uh, it's the same word for faith, and I would prefer to use the word faith, but I used kind of a device to keep things in symmetry and in, in the back of your mind. I said where this confes confession, confesseth, is the word is where behavior and belief intersect and come out of the individual. So it is not just opening the opening of the mouth. Essentially, it is the actions that accompany, which like faith. Dr. Scott defined faith as action. Action based on belief is seen by confidence. It is the activity or the action that comes with the words. If it was just this, the mouth going, we all know that at times our mouth is going and our body ain't going anywhere, right? So it can't just be meant as that. I've already defined the word in a message a long time ago. If you're not sure, go listen to that message. But there's a key factor here that every spirit that confesseth, based on what I just said, that Jesus Christ, here's the key, is come in the flesh. This is a, would be, not for today, but it would be a fascinating study, and I may even do it. So if you are like me and you like church history and things that pertain to how things either developed or didn't develop, this particular uh, verse right here is come in the flesh is of God, uh, is come in the flesh is the key. Why there were many people in that day that either said Jesus had not come or had not yet come or did not truly come in the flesh. There were many heresies and false doctrines being propagated even in the day when John was writing this. So the key thing is in the flesh, which brings us back to a writing from John's gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh. In other words, he's in a, in a I would say, a very subtle way, describing the eternal person, coming into and onto the stage of time. Anyone who denies this, essentially, he says, is not of God. And there are, of course, as I said, in the first church, and it has continued down through the ages, there have been a lot of heresies that have come up. But the reason for looking at this now, and I will elaborate on festival, is there is a, we'll call it a plan of spiritual discernment laid out here. And... Part of the problem, I feel, and it's still a problem today, is people not understanding the design, what the church is for. And even though I've, I've said this in many different ways, I looked earnestly to find someone else other than me who could say it in a different way, and I could present it to you this way. I have a few bullet points from the late, great uh, A.W. Tozer, who kind of put a footnote on spiritual discernment. What exactly, if we are going to try the spirits, whether they are of God, it presupposes something. It presupposes the ability to have that discernment, which, by the way, can only come from the Spirit of God being in you. You see, the carnal, we, we did this weeks ago, out of the Apostle Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians, the carnal man cannot discern spiritual things, is, is against, is that enmity. So, this wonderful, we'll call it practical questions to test or try the spirit put out by Dr. Tozier, uh, probably in, I'm going to say, don't have the exact date, sometime in the 50s or 60s, directives that clarify the real reason why one should be listening to sound doctrine, Bible teaching, and the effects it should bring on the hearer. So these are his points I have perhaps uh, change them just a little bit. One or two of them, kind of the way he articulated his question, reflects his um, doctrines on certain areas, which I don't necessarily agree with. But the first thing he asks is, how does the teaching I am receiving affect my relationship and attitude with the Lord? So from 
John, try the spirits. How does it affect my, how is the teaching? And I wanted, I wanted to apply it here in a strange way to ask the question, but I also want it to be a universal message put out to all those people who may listen on TV or on the internet or on YouTube, wherever they're watching, because this is a, we'll call it some form of an outline that if you're going to a church, any church, anywhere, these ought to be some of the things you go down and you look at as why I go to church, not anything else. How does the teaching I'm receiving affect my relationship and attitude toward or with the Lord? Is he magnified, glorified, or diminished? And I'm going to put a footnote here. Any place where somebody is focusing on you, the self, your best you this year, today, how you can accomplish your personal best outside of the dimensions that God, through his God-inspired servants, God, all scripture is God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16, outside of that, anything that is deification of self or self-motivation for the self is not glorifying or magnifying God. So how does this teaching affect my relationship? That's number one. Number two, how does the teaching I receive affect my attitude toward the scripture? Is it in agreement with the rest of the book? Do I gain understanding and depth? Does it confirm itself? The question is, am I receiving sound doctrine? And the only way, as I've said many times before, to accomplish that, one of the Giants of the faith said the scripture must confirm itself. That means if there's some, something somewhere and the preacher is saying this one thing, you better be able, and the preacher better be able first and foremost, to go in there and back it up with other things because you can make doctrine out of anything. You ever seen that cooking show where they give you a basket of stuff and you've got to make something with it? It's kind of like that. You can make it into anything you want as long as you use those ingredients. Well, you'd be surprised at what people will do with the scripture, just quoting a little bit and taking the rest out of context. So how does the teaching I receive affect my attitude toward the scripture? And I would say as a sidebar, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, which I've told you many times, including last week's message, if it makes you go back and reflect and really think and reflect on yourself, then there's something good going on, even though it's uncomfortable. There's something good going on. Now, if all you ever heard were flattering words and how great... Everybody likes to be told how... You look really great, and you do look great today. (laughs) But you wouldn't like it if I said, wow, you look like hell today. (laughs) Everybody likes to be told how youthful they look, how you look... you You don't look a day over 40. That's true. That's true. But, you know... I would say everybody likes to have that youthful, you know, well, even the person that is well into their 80s and 90s, wow, you look great, right? No one wants to tell they they look old and decrepit, right? (laughs) But when it comes to the Word of God, we have to take exactly what's there. And the lessons, although many times they are tough, they have to be applied to the heart. It's the only way we can be conformed to the image and likeness of the Son, Third, how does the teaching I receive affect my life? Does it feed pride and ego? Or does it humble me at times? And I can tell you, I spend most of the time in that it humbles me most of the time. Because I read it and I think it's an indictment. I read the scripture many times and I think that's an indictment on me. I don't speak of you. Do whatever you want with it. I told you, I'm not your police person. I'm not your fruit inspector. But at times, I read the scripture and I, I, I feel... It's an indictment because I'm not there. And then I'll take it to prayer and I'll ask the Lord to help me because it's something that I would deeply desire for him to work out in me and through me, but I don't want to be doing it as in a work that I put on. I said, if God's not doing it, what's the point, right? So is it humbling or does it create the desire to think about, as I just said earlier, what has been received? Does the teaching I receive build up myself? or bring me to a real new reality about who God is and how God has laid out his plan of salvation for me? These are all wonderful questions that if somebody was saying, 
How do I know? Well, I'll go back and ask these questions. At least, I'm not saying they're, they're exhaustive, but they at least capture the essence to be able to come back and have spiritual discernment that you're sitting and listening to Bible teaching sound doctrine. And there's one thing to listen. There's another thing to take something to heart. Your doctor tells you you need medication for a condition you have, and you say, okay, yeah, 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 that's great. Or you even go one step further. You fill the prescription, but you never take the medicine. It's not going to help you. How do you think God feels when he says, look, don't ask me for something new. You, you haven't even finished reading and looking through and combing the details of what I've revealed to you. And you want what? Right, that's what I said. How does the teaching affect my relationship with my brothers and fellow man? Have I become puffed up with knowledge and therefore I withdraw myself? I can't associate with them because they're still in the, you know, the baby food stage. Or am I constantly brought into a fresh need of God's help to navigate the challenges of relating to other people? And I, I claim the second one because it is challenging. And if you're honest with yourself and before God, it is challenging to relate to some people. Some people you meet and they've got all the, they've got all the theological answers to everything and the political ones and everything that you could possibly want to know. They are the portable curmudgeon of all things that you just, right. I need the Lord's help a lot of times, most of the time, in fact, all of the time, relating to people. You know how you are and how I am in the flesh. The flesh just, man, hmm. Yeah. How does the teaching affect my relationship with the world? Do I still want to gravitate towards it once knowing the knowledge of what is revealed? How do I understand myself living in time, yet living in the world, and yet chosen out of the world? How does this affect that? These are all, in my opinion, very good questions. I, as I said, I may have um, filed them down a little bit, just a little bit. If you've read Toja, you may know why. Um, and some people may say this type of analysis is irrelevant. Why? Because it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe, believe in something, right? I believe I can fly. <laughs> okay. Go off, find the highest place you can jump off of and test the theory. See if it works. As long as you believe in something. In fact, I was in a mixed um, multi-faith gathering one time, and that one of the people got up and said, as long as we believe in something, and I thought, wow, I believe I want to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but I will elaborate on this, but there's a, there, there is a, what I'd call a key element of him explaining spiritual discernment, and that's vitally in 1 John 4, that chapter kind of moves through it. Um, so it's vitally important that I'm using this to kind of move along into the message I desire to go to today that at least I think will be helpful. Um, but I started looking at those questions and I thought, you know, that's a really good way to phrase things because ultimately um, even John is talking about what is happening these individuals in John's day that were leading people to worship false gods or fa a false god or false gods. Well, that's still happening today. And I don't have to start naming names and calling people out. It's all around us. If you are not being taught out of the word and having the teacher or preacher open up the word of God and give you an understanding or clarity, whether it is through language, through grammar, through uh, taking different passages in a hermeneutical way, however you want, it must be, that should be at the core of everything. When somebody says, why, why theology? Remember the, the fellow that used to say, you're still teaching theology? <laughs> well, I might ask you, what else is there to teach <laughs> if you're coming into the church? And just crazy things. They're just absolutely... But there are plenty of churches that have been built around these auxiliary concepts. And what happens is you've got people who may have a good heart or a desire, but they're in a place 
where these things I've just referenced that Tozier highlighted are not the core and center of the church. When I say auxiliary, let me just give you a perfect case in point. There are people that may attend a church and their focus, they come and they must open their Bibles because that's what we do, but they're more interested in, they're more interested in things that are, we'll call them secondary and tertiary matters that may be edifying to the faith if one has a solid, solid grip and a solid uh, mind into the scriptures. But secondary and tertiary studies can even lead you, as I've called them, into black holes. And you disappear into those things. You get engrossed in them rather than being engrossed into the scriptures. And really, excuse me for saying it this way, but finding yourself lost in the book is far superior for an individual who's truly trying to understand the mind of the Lord than being swallowed up in a book that indeed it may reflect some form of whether it's Christian history or doctrine. I just said I'd love to teach on Christian history and give you a little church history, and that's wonderful. I, I love to do that as long as I can bring it back to something that has a definitive impact on us through this word, count me in. Otherwise, just for the sake of entertaining and taking you off somewhere else, no thank you. The time is limited. The time we have here in the church is limited. The scripture says the time indeed is short and we ought to redeem the time. So I'm laying out this footprint to say some people may be a little bit confused about why, why study this much, why do this much. And there really is one thing that can lead you back, that one phrase that says that Christ is come in the flesh and is of God. There were many people in Christ's day that acknowledged him as coming of God but did not really understand or know. There was no crystal clear theological breakdown. And many heresies developed in the church, in the early church, that brought about through many church councils certain set doctrines that even those set doctrines became warped. Um, so the, the thing I would say here is the origin of the message, and I'm going to elaborate because there'll be people who will even misconstrue this. The origin of the message, it either comes from God or it comes from the devil. That's pretty simple, right? The message is either about Christ dying on the cross, shedding his blood, dying for a lost world, which is you and me, coming to reconcile us back, giving us life eternal for our simple faith in him, letting us understand he paid the price. We're not living under the law. There's a, there's a crust of, of things to actually take hold of. Or the message is from the devil. It's all about you. How you can get more money from God. How your money will work for you today in God's plan. Turn to page 322 of my new book called uh, The Checklist of How to Make Your Money Work for God underscore your money, right? So it's either from God or from the devil. You may not like the messenger. No one said you had to. Guess what? In Paul's day, many rejected him. They said he was weak and his speech was weak. Well, for a man who was weak in speech, he made up for, I think, in pen greatly. <laughs> Wouldn't you say? Two-thirds of the New Testament. So I think that shut the mouths of the uh, enemies out there. We're even told the reason to try the spirits and to be sure of what the instruction is more for new people than the ones who've been here for a while is that we're told even at the end of days, even the very elect will be deceived. Why? Because miracles and great swelling words and even prophecies will be declared by the spirit of Antichrist or even we'll say the prophet, the spirit of Antichrist or Antichrist himself. So if you think about that, the saying, even the very elect will be deceived, is a frightening mindset that says, how will people be able to discern? I just told you. So um, we've at least got some framework by which to work on. That brings me to um, the fact that today people are overloaded, specifically by the wonderful technology of the Internet. People are overloaded by a plethora of voices coming at you, and it's on any subject. You know, have you ever looked up something? Let's step away from the book for a minute. Have you ever looked up a medical condition or a remedy? Have you ever done that before? Show me your hands. <laughs> right, see? 
And yeah, the first one, you know, there's a few trusted names you go to, but then there's a whole host of other people. And they say, well, no, wait a minute. You don't need that. What you really need is this. And they're all screaming for your attention. We're on overload. Some of them sound so good. It's a natural cure. Try it. Or this is the, you know. And so you can get very confused. Imagine if you didn't have the foundation you had and you were trying to find answers to spiritual things. Just the internet alone could become a very confusing place with a lot of voices and a lot of false prophets making a lot of declarations, including merchandise off of people because they're not savvy enough or they don't really, they haven't learned the Bible, they don't know any better. The reason why I'm highlighting this is you could probably lift this part of my message out and apply it universally to anything in any subject regarding this book, the church. And if you can clearly see, it's not very complicated, but there is, there's a lot of confusion out there. So when I reached into this, there was a reason for going down this pathway. Um, try the spirits, because elsewhere we are told about other spirits at work. Here, John is referencing the spirit of false prophets and of Antichrist. But elsewhere, we're having to contend with uh, the wiles of the devil, with enemies, we call them from without and from within, sent from the devil. And these Antichrist false prophets sent, by the way, it's one source. I said the message is either coming from God or from the devil. And if you don't have the ability to discern where it's coming from, or you're one of these people that likes to be judgmental, you'll form the opinion that this does not look like a person of God, therefore it must be of the devil. People did that to Dr. Scott. That, can't, that container cannot be of God. Because a man of God or a woman of God looks a certain way. Well, tell me how they look. Tell me how, boy, I could do something with this real good. You know, did she look good when she was covered up on the side of the road as a widow, uh, you know, before she went in and played the whore and then said, um, you've impregnated me, I'm pregnant with your daughter. You know what story I'm talking about. Did she look like a spiritual woman covered up? As a widow, I'm sure she did, but that same one uncovered, they accused her of being a whore. So you have to put things in perspective. The eyes do not have the ability, the spirit does, to discern based on the things that are being proclaimed out of this book. So I'm doing the background right here to tell you it's important to have this foundation to try the spirits, and Paul, the Apostle Paul knew all about that because much of the writing, especially in a passage we've been to many times before, refers to putting on the whole armor of God. And I think many times when we've read through that, we understand we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We will call them the unseen fighting forces that are not of God. They are sent to disrupt. They are sent to impede. They are sent to discourage the saints. They are sent as warfare against we'll call it the mark or the signature, the autograph that's been placed on your heart where God says, this is mine. You remember I used that last week or week before. Sent to make warfare against that, not against you personally. Don't take it personal. And a lot of people say, oh, it's, you know, it's because of me. No, 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 friend. Because if it was only because of you and there was no Christ in you, believe me, the devil would be figuring, first of all, the devil wouldn't waste time with you because you're not important in that respect. They're talking about the container, the shell, the self, right? Not important. But what is important is when the devil sees someone who's been taken out of the world, translated into the kingdom of God, bearing, we'll call it, we, we, we want to call it the marks, the stigmata, if you want to call it the, the signature of God on your heart, bearing witness to the fact that you have been moved from this, the the we'll call it the edge of hell, into his dear and beloved kingdom, well, man, you become a target. I've taught on this many times before. Now, there are people out there listening to me who, as I speak about this subject, they'll say, wow, that's nutty. I never heard such a thing. Or you believe in the devil? Well, please don't ask the question because it's insanity for anybody to say they don't believe in the devil. Or I know I've heard this one. The interpretation of the scripture is that 
Jesus conquered everything at the cross, so the devil is no more. Okay, then. All righty. Now, if you believe that, then I just have a wonderful day. Go about your business. But if you really do understand that, as I do, and I think you do as well, turn with me to Ephesians 6, because that is where I'm going to get my message out of. The message is not that long, because the idea here, I've already painted the picture that, as I said, can be applied to any place, any preaching, any doctrine. And as long as it's coming out of this book, I think it's pretty safe to say, and as long as the individual is not resting, that is twisting and caricaturing the scripture into something that it is not, it's safe to say that in terms of spiritual discernment, you would listen and say, I need this. This will help my soul. These other things out there, they may sound really good, but that's all they do is sound good. They are nothing. So Ephesians 6, we visited this many times before. I'm not going through the whole, the, the, the point is not to go through the whole chapter and teach through the whole sixth chapter or all of the spiritual armor. There are six pieces beginning, um, the section I'm looking at is from verse 10, Ephesians 6, verse 10, through verse 18. However, if you put it all together and condense it all, there are six pieces of spiritual armor. For example, the breastplate that is referenced in um, verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. We'd say the breastplate, for example, it's safe to say it guards the heart where the seed of affections and desires abide. Uh, we know that Christ is formed in our heart by faith. So of course, we need to have that put on the full armor, this part of the panoply, the breastplate, to guard the heart. Um, there are other, and by the way, when it says of righteousness, not mine or yours, but his, which leads you back to Christ again. I remember Dr. Scott used to say, not righteousness, but righteousified. That was his, one of his things when he was teaching out of Romans. We've been righteousified. So when you talk about the breastplate of righteousness, it is how I am seen in him and what I have received I guard earnestly. This is putting on the breastplate. It's not exhaustive. I'm trying to be fast because I am going to run out of time. He covers the entire person in this section from head to toe, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Uh, that ought to tell you every believer has to have this equipment. Feet shod means we are constantly walking, we're moving, and we're not shod with some other thing like the best you now, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We walk, then we can say, thy word is a lamp under my feet. We can take all of it and use it all as equipment. Um, the verse I'm looking at is verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now the sword, unlike all the other things mentioned in this list, does not protect one particular part of the body, helmet, head, breastplate, chest, shoes, feet. But the sword, and specifically the short sword, the rima, not the logos, but that's, for this purpose, is somewhat irrelevant, is used to fight back at the enemy, not defending a particular body part. It is offensive. It, is, it has an offensive use and a defensive use as well, and a delicate wielding of that must be grasped. We shouldn't be careless or foolish to take hold of this passage and say, I'm puffed up because... But rather, Paul says, he says, let him that thinks that he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. There's a, there's, everything has a delicate balance in here. We have an exhortation to use the sword that is supplied. Let me read that again, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I want to say one thing that I never pointed out before, which is important. The sword of the Spirit, I'm going to say this real carefully, does not equal the Word. The word is Christ. The logos is Christ. The rimas of God, the rima is, are the sayings of God. We cannot even say that 
the sword of the spirit, or the spirit is the ream of God. This would completely undo everything we've come to know about the Logos, Christ. But what we do understand is the sword of the spirit, what, what is wielded, can only come, we can only have that understanding of how to use and how to deal with by the Spirit helping us. And, you know, imagine before you came to church and before you had a Bible trying to use the Word of God for something. It's like claiming a promise if you don't know what to claim and you, don't, you haven't even read the book. How can you claim a promise? How can you ask for something in the book that you don't even know that so you can't wield it? The Spirit has to guide you in that. A pastoring teacher has the same issues and then does the same thing for the flock, leading and guiding, opening up, shedding light on through the Spirit. So we have an exhortation here, the sword is supplied, but I say this carefully. There are people who have made all kinds of doctrines about uh, this passage. There is one thing to know the contents of the book. I've met people who can quote chapter and verse like there's no tomorrow. In fact, I remember being in a prison one place, and the guy stood from when I came in to when I left. He didn't come sit in the service. He stood at the door, and all he did, he rattled off chapter and verse, chapter and verse, chapter and verse. And while I was walking out the door, he opened up, and he had like a fold-out with lots and lots of scripture, and they were all handwritten, but he was quoting them all. Well, that's a perfect example of how you know that somebody knows, has memorized the scripture, but has not understood the principle because a little, even a little common decency would say, you come in and you sit down to the preacher and listen to what's being said because there might actually be a word for you today. Get your butt in a chair, sit down and listen. That's all. That's a good spiritual word, right? <laughs> but memorizing the book is not the same as knowing God's word and how to apply it. So when we talk about wielding the sword of the Spirit, by the way, that's never an attack ever on a brother or a sister in the Lord. And I've met plenty of those. They'll come at you with Scripture, and they're like, oh, a, a double-edged, you know, a person with a double-edged tongue is always unstable. Wait, wait. First of all, <laughs> first of all, you're quoting James to me, so get a life. Second of all... <laughs> Second of all, text out of context. Can I just say, that is the thing that is most aggravating. From the Bible to when somebody repeats something they heard in the news. I've heard somebody, oh, did you hear this thing? And they'll, they'll, it's a soundbite of something they heard. And even that is out of context and becomes error. By the way, the media is great at that. They'll take one thing and then it becomes that. And then suddenly, there's war happening somewhere. Yes, okay. It's not like that. And we need to be very careful about handling the Word of God. This, in fact, was the era, if you study a little bit of church history, the Quakers, George Fox began in a right place with the understanding of the Holy Spirit guiding, but then the, the Word became less and less important, and inner illumination from where I don't know, not so much the Scriptures, became the doctrine that ultimately led George Fox and many of his followers astray. The sword is to be used by us. It is given unto us. Much like all these other things that we're reading, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, well, truth and righteousness come, comes from him, not from us. The gospel of peace, we don't have a gospel apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Taking the shield of faith, you can have faith in anything, but we're talking about faith in Christ. All of these things lead back to the same place. The helmet of salvation, and we're not talking about any type of salvation, but salvation which is in Christ. I have a one-track mind here today. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So it's really important to see that we are given this. And if you remember at the beginning of this subject, I said that we have equipment as you've been called and chosen by God, you've been given equipment, and a lot of us don't know what to do with it. As I said, it's like having, having uh, any of you get some gift for your kitchen for Christmas, but you have to read the instructions, otherwise you don't know what to do. You know, you know the basic principle. You know the basic principle of food processor, processor right? 
but you've never used one before, I suggest you read the instructions before you put your fingers in the hole, right? It's kind of like that. So here is a clear cut knowing exactly what we're doing. Otherwise, again, leads to error. It leads to all kinds of doctrines that we are going to be exposing ourselves to in, in error. And then, of course, the sword. Speaking of the sword, I will just touch on that word briefly. As I said, Rima. And by the way, this is all to fight and combat the wiles and the schemes and the methods of the devil. And all you've got to do is go back into Matthew's gospel, the record account of Christ after his baptism, being led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. And the three times he is tempted, and the three times Jesus replies. He didn't have to, by the way, but it's a clear demonstration of wielding the sword. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The devil said, turn these stones to bread. As he knew that he hungered, that he had been without food many days. Turn these stones to bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In other words, there is a way to combat the enemy. But let me go back to the first thought, which is, if one is truly not sure about where things are coming from, try the spirits. Try and examine. This is why I chose, I looked carefully for something that would really sum up where we tend to, most of us, fall off the deep end. We're, well, that sounds, it sounds like scripture. It sounds good. And I'm really talking to people out there in TV land more so than the people sitting in the church here. It sounds like scripture. It sure sounds like doctrine. I heard the preacher standing there on that big platform say a couple of Jesuses and amens, and so that, that's pretty spiritual, right? That's, that's, that's pretty religious, right? That's pretty, that means something. They're in church, right? At least they're there, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, go talk to the folks who maybe escaped from uh, the David Koresh or one of those type of things. Yeah, they were there too. Um, the design of this is to understand once we try the spirits, the discernment that comes is equipment not here just for service, but equipment for our life. And that requires us to be savvy in handling the word of God. Now, this is, it seems, it is a very simple message. The problem is, in its application, not so much to the people sitting in front of me, but to newer people who hear it, the tragedy is, being so comfortable hearing a message that is pleasing to the self, that makes you feel good. I'd love to be able to stand here and preach a couple of nitro, message, nitro pill messages, which I need to do because I feel the need to, to do that for you and for me. But this is equipment. These messages have been designed to kind of sort out the stuff that looks like and the stuff that kind of is from the stuff that is. And there's a lot of those voices out there. There's a lot of people saying, well, you know, you, you need not be so dogmatic about certain things because in the big picture, as long as you kind of get the gist of it, it's okay. Well, my problem with that is as long as you get the gist of it, it's okay, is like saying close is good or close is good enough. And if you've been called out from among those people who haven't been called, close doesn't really cut it. At least air this way. I came to know the truth in Christ. I read my Bible. I tried to study, and yet I still fell down. Well, the Lord picked me up because he knows my ways. He's acquainted with them. He knows that. You understand the difference? Because it's, it's, it really seems black and white, cut and dry, but for most people it is not. And if we are to take the sword of the Spirit, that means we are to familiarize ourselves with passages that will help us. What do you think it means in the scripture when it says, you know, resist the devil and he flees from you? Well, if you're wielding the sword of the spirit, trust me, that's a great way to uh, make the devil flee from you. Resisting, well, how does one resist? Well, you can say I can claim a promise, but you'd have to know what the word, what the remas are to do that. Now, you can just plainly say, devil, get away from me. That's great. <laughs> that's the simplest lesson you could learn in church. 
But if you're wielding the sword of the Spirit, it requires being familiar with the Scriptures. Now in John's day, I'm going jumping back to John a little bit. In John's day, he had the problem of, again, eyewitness to Christ, and yet people were still listening to other people tell, well, this is what you ought to do, or this is what you have to do, or this is what you must do. Paul, who was an eyewitness to Christ, he got personally trained by him in the desert, but I, certainly an eyewitness to Christ on the Damascus Road, no question about that. And yet people still came in and perverted the doctrines that he preached and proclaimed. And these are the same people that he said, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you going to finish in the flesh? Are you going to ruin the whole matter by now going back to your former ways? Are you going to be saved in the law and by the law? Or have you been set free from the law because Christ became a curse for us? The law fell on him and we have essentially passed out from underneath that curse because of what he did. These are the dilemmas that the church is now looking at in different ways, but not from the way I just said. See, the church is more interested in how do I escape preaching these doctrines because these, these doctrines, which I'm standing here today telling you about, are not popular. They don't feed the self. They actually force the self to be crucified bit by bit. That's the message out of this book, not to keep working on the self and keep polishing the self. The self is never going to be made into anything but exactly that self. So when I think about the dilemma that John faced in his time, it still exists today and, in fact, more abundantly. And this is why, to close the year, I thought, you know, I could talk about and look at the year in retrospect and we could talk about not looking at the things that are behind, but looking at the things that are ahead. Or I could have used a scripture that said, consider all the ways the Lord has led you all, these, all this year. Be grateful. I could have gone anywhere, but I feel the best equipment that we need going into the new year, and believe me, the only thing that's going to change is going to be the date, the last digit out of four. Because, you know, when you wake up and it's 2018, you're going to look in the mirror and it's still going to be you. <laughs> Beautiful, youthful, not a day older, <laughs> maybe a dime richer, maybe. No, not really. Same you, same troubles, same self. That's why I said, save yourself the time of making a resolution. <laughs> Just save yourself the effort. Because you know you ain't going to stick to it anyway, first of all. You know, I'm, this year I'm, gonna, I'm going to do this. Even the people that come into the church and they say, this year I'm going to get real with God and I'm going to study more. And that lasts all but about, you know, maybe a Sunday and a half until the next best football game or something else comes on TV or your kids want, take me to the beach. I don't want to go to church. That lasts for just a little while. The best equipment you could get going into the new year is what I'm doing today, which is kind of a call to say, Abide in the word. Stay in the word. And for those people who are just beginning to feel their way around, and you're not so familiar, you don't know any scripture, you know, you've read one book of the Bible, maybe you've read a few books, I don't know. The importance of listening then, because you can't always be reading, tuning into the network. There's either a program of myself or of Dr. Gene Scott playing 24 hours a day. There are designated feeds for each of us. There are places where you can select certain teachings if you want to learn or listen to something in particular. And all of this is designed to equip you. There is no, if somebody says, well, there's something else. Well, there really is nothing else. It's equipping you for the calling with which you've been called, equipping you for the journey, and equipping you and me to grow in him. And there's no way you're going to do that wielding some other form of a sword. And by the way, when it speaks of a sword, and I'm using this again, going back to this idea. It's a short sword. There are two words for swords in the Bible. This is a short one. That's the one that's handy for just, you know, going at it anywhere you need to. It's the same sword, by the way, that you'd probably want to, if you were, if you were going to offer a sacrifice, <laughs> you'd want to use a short one. <laughs> the long one would be self-defense. But um, the idea here is that you don't need to master uh, a whole chapter of the Bible. You don't need to memorize 
a whole book. If you want to do that, that's your business. But wielding the sword of the Spirit, which is the Rima, as those short sayings of God, is understanding what this church has been taught for all these years. So when we come to a place where we know we need healing, we go and we claim the passage out of Exodus. The Lord says, I'm the Lord that healeth thee. We know the places to go. Those are for our needs specifically. This one area I'm focusing on has more to do with combating the enemy at work in our lives. And if you don't think that there is a force to be reckoned with, and I hate to use the word force because it's abundantly more than force, at work to derail you from your walk, I'm going to speak first to the young people in this church who, you know, maybe born and raised in this church, maybe listened or maybe remember Dr. Scott or you see Dr. Scott on the network and he spoke abundantly about this thing. You're prime targets. The young people are prime targets. I, I pray for you all the time. I know who you are. You're prime targets. Why? Because it's always the same thing. You come to the faith. Your parents can share their faith with you. You can discuss it in the home. But people around you, they may not understand, and that causes you to feel alienated, alone, afraid. What if people actually know what I believe? It's that pressure that comes, unfortunately, it comes to all of us at every age. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I don't have to be conformed to that. And, you know, maybe I will be like the salmon going the wrong direction. I'm speaking still to the young folks. But God's called you to something greater than the things of the world, and God's called you to something more. So having a knowledge of the sword of the Spirit, the Rima, even if it's a beginning, and I actually know there's one or two of you younger folks that know the Scriptures really well and are able to wield, probably wield the sword at your folks. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, it's required for every child of God, young and old. It's required for every individual. Going back to John's words when he says, ye are of God. Do you not think that the devil hates that? Ye are of God. Do you not think that the devil says, how can I attack that one? And even the most seasoned Christian, the most seasoned warrior here is never immune. You're never going to be in the clear where an attack is not coming. And I just refer to the temptation of Christ because, quite frankly, if Christ could be tempted by the devil, what makes you or I think that we would be excused, ignored, or exempt? It doesn't work that way. People who've been delivered from a life of drugs and alcohol, the devil said, hey, it worked one time. Now you're, you've been delivered and you're feeling the, the, the bonds that once held you in prison. You, you feel the deliverance, you know it, but the devil says, it worked before. We'll see if we can't get them back. Go back to the sword of the spirit. I use the scripture, which indeed, even for those people who are just breaking out, greater is he that is in me, greater is he, the spirit of God placed in me, than he that is in the world, the prince of the power of the air and his minions and all the attacks that come upon me. If the Bible says I'm more than a conqueror, I'm not more than a conqueror in the flesh, but I'm more than a conqueror in the spirit for Christ who died for me and gave that direct promise of the Father to those disciples that carried on from Pentecost to now, the promise of the Comforter to be with us. I'm not in this thing alone. I don't have to fight my battles alone. I've got someone with me helping me. That's the sword of the Spirit. I can do all things through Christ. The day you wake up and you say, I just can't, I've had it. You know, maybe you're like me. I've had a year, we'll call it a year and a half, maybe two years of really serious attacks on my health. And prior to that, prior to those the two years past, I've had many attacks. They've been like paper cuts. The last two years, um, between the combination of cancer and a plethora of other things, including an operation I still have to have, which I have disclosed to you and told you about. It's taken me this long to find a doctor. But even these things, I call them attacks on my body. They can happen to anybody. It doesn't mean you've committed some terrible sin because you have a sickness, but it means you begin to wield the sword. I will not lose my grip of faith over any sickness or disease brought into my life. Why? Because I know he is the one who heals. He, he has already, by his stripes, I am, I was, it's done. 
I must stand in faith and claim it. I'm wielding the sword of the Spirit when I say everything apart, everything around me is falling apart. But that's the eyes, the flesh. The Spirit says, you hold tight right where you are. You stand on that rock, Christ, who has never moved, immovable, unshakable. You stand on that foundation. You will be safe. You will be whole. And I'm not making anything that isn't within the Scriptures to say wielding the sword of the Spirit allows me and it allows you in the most difficult times and in the best of times when you don't think you ought to have your guard up to start your day by recognizing the devil might rear his head today and possibly send a couple of fiery darts your way, but you know exactly what to do. And that's why I said equipping the saints to me is much more important than having some uh, feel-good syrup that's poured on you for uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes on Sunday, calling that church and sending you on your way. Either the devil is completely not interested and won't harm you, or someone has just preached the devil's message to you. And I just said a mouthful, probably made a lot of enemies, but that's what I do best. So let us end the year and enter into the new one, wielding the sword of the Spirit, the Spirit to his glory, to his praise, knowing he has called us, he has equipped us, and we can say the captain of our salvation has gone ahead of us and paved the way. We look to this book in guidance through the Spirit to be able to make it through with a certain knowledge that these, we'll call them roadmaps for our faith, have a design. We pick them up, we wield them. We don't wield them to injure others uh, unintentionally. We wield them to ward off the enemy and to make it through each and every day. That is the gift God has given us. I hope this one at least puts a, a crystal clear idea that there are many things out there floating around, but this one thing that comes out of the word is sure and true because it is the truth of his word in Jesus' name. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.